Hi, I'm James Verdeer, and welcome to the American Institute of Biological Sciences Bioscience Talks, which is a forum for integrating the life sciences. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Alessandro Siqueira, postdoctoral fellow at James Cook University in Townsville, Australia, where he works in the lab of Professor David Bellwood. He joined me to talk about reef fish evolution and how we're learning more about that topic from some recent findings in Mayan temples. I'll let him explain all of that, so let's go straight to the interview. Dr. Saketa, thank you very much for joining me today. Yeah, no, it's my pleasure to be here. My pleasure to be talking to you. Great. So I was hoping we could start off um, by talking about you know what I think is probably one of the main hooks of this story, which is the Mayan temple crossover um, with fish evolution. So you know what was found in you know these Mayan temples, and what does it tell us about the evolution of reef fishes? Yeah, this is really a fascinating story that came from Mexico. Right, so that's where the the Mayan temples are located, and the the cool thing is that the fossils, which uh, have been already described in the past, so this is just a, our article is essentially an overview uh, of these fossils and putting them into a broader um, evolutionary overview of uh, fish uh, and and modern fishes, I I shall say. But the, the connection with the Mayan temples is that uh, these fossils were originally found, not specifically the fish ones that we are talking about in the paper, but some other uh, fossils, uh, fish fossils were found in the slabs that were used to build these Mayan temples. So they were originally found by archaeologists that were exploring the Mayan temples around the 2000s. And this led to some other paleontologists then to question themselves, oh, where do these fossils come from? And they end up doing some analysis on the limestone to finally find the, the original location to where the, the, the slabs have been uh, removed from. And that location turns out to be a very interesting uh, deposit of fish fossils. And more importantly, in our case, the, some of these fossils or some of these groups, they belong to families that we know today from coral reefs, right? One of the most diverse um, uh, ecosystems in the planet, right? So that's, that's kind of the, the connection there. Okay, so we've got these fossils that are found within the Mayan temples. It was land that was, of course, underwater at the time of the fossils formation. <laughs> um, and I'm wondering what it is about this particular set of findings that allows us to you know, learn a whole lot about reef fish evolution. Yeah, it's, it, there are two main things, two key things about these fossils that make them super exciting and super interesting. And these two things are essentially their location and their timing. First, uh, talking about their location, um, essentially what uh, the, these fossils in this location uh, is really, really close to where the asteroid that killed the non-avian dinosaurs uh, hit the Earth. So essentially the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico, right, where, the, where they found evidence that this asteroid had hit the Earth 66 million years ago, it's 500 kilometers away from the place where these fossil deposits were found. So this is super interesting in itself. But then when you link that to the age of these fossils, so these uh, limestones, they have been dated to be around 63 million years ago. So only 3 million years after uh, the asteroid hit the Earth. So putting these things together, you kind of see the evidence of the rise of these new groups of fish that were not present in the fossil record before the, as we call this, this boundary, the KPG boundary or, or the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary. There were no um, records of modern fish fauna, modern reef fish fauna as we know them today. And only three million years after this asteroid hit the Earth, we have evidence of such groups. And three of which we uh, talk about in the paper specifically, um, and which is super 
fascinating to think about, you know, in such a short period of time and very close to where the asteroid uh, event happened, we have these uh, new fish groups arising in, in evolutionary history, which uh, eventually throughout the Cenozoic or, or throughout the last 60 million years ended up forming some really uh, diverse coral reef fauna. Okay, that's that's really fascinating. And I'm wondering now, you know, what this particular deposit um, gave us that, you know, was particularly new. I mean, the, the location, obviously, and the timing, but what did we know about, you know, reef fish before we, this particular deposit was found? Was there, were there troves all over the place? Were we basing our knowledge on a relatively small number of fossils that had been previously discovered? What was kind of the state of play earlier on? Yeah, that's, that's a great question because it contextualizes our knowledge on uh, what were the fossils, the reef fish fossils that we had before. And most reef fish fossils, well, to start with, actually, uh, reef fish fossils are relatively rare. So it's not very common to have very good deposits of coral reef fishes. The most famous one is located in Italy. So in a place that is famous, famously known as Monte Bocca. So Monte Bocca is a very, very important um, a fossil deposit for modern fish fauna. But the date uh, of uh, Monte Boca, it's uh, a little bit later when compared to the, the Mexican deposit. So Monte Boca is dated to be around 50 million years. And uh, until the discovery of these Mexican fossils, these were the Monte Boca fossils were some of the earliest evidence that we had for some of these um, modern reef fish lineages, right? So by finding these fossils, these earlier fossils in Mexico, uh, essentially 13 million years earlier than Monte Boca, this reshapes a little bit the understanding uh, about the, not only obviously the location of uh, the origin of these fish groups, but also the timing. So we always suspected uh, that between 66 million years uh, in the KPG boundary and until Monte Boca 50 million years ago, this there was this kind of gap in uh, the fossil deposits. So there was nothing to prove the origin of these, these fish groups. But given some molecular analysis now using you know, modern fish DNA, we could kind of estimate that the origin was probably around, you know, 60 million years or 55 million years. But these fossils now from Mexico, they really help us to pinpoint the, the date of origin of these um, uh, fish families or fish groups. And it, it helps us putting them using some modern analysis, some other phylogenetic analysis to really pinpoint the origin of these groups to be really, really close to the KPG boundary, which is what we originally suspected, you know, given uh, evidence from other vertebrate groups, such as um, mammals, um, that a lot of them radiated after this boundary. But for fish, because we didn't have the fossil evidence, uh, it was really hard to, to, to make this, uh, th this timing, to get this timing correctly. So that's, that's another. So you had, you know, uh, prior to this discovery, you knew 66 million years ago, you had the KPG boundary, um, you know, where the asteroid hits and kills the non-avian dinosaurs. And then the next thing you knew for sure was you had fossils that were dated to 50 million years ago that were in Italy. Correct. And so you have this, you know, roughly 16 million year gap, which is a pretty big gap yeah. um, where you don't exactly know what's going on and you're, you're making estimates based on molecular techniques. That's correct. Yeah. And I, I want to talk more about those in a second, but so you've kind of got a little bit of an idea. Now this Discovery tells you, hey, they were there 60 million years ago, 63 million years ago, was it? 63, that's right, yeah. That's that's really fascinating. That, that must have been a big surprise, a you know, really interesting finding. Yeah, it, it was. And 
like I said, in this paper, we're doing a little bit of an overview, combining these fossils within the broader uh, reef fish evolutionary history. So e each one of these fossils had already been described in the past. And the, the, the interesting thing is that uh, as, as they were described, we, we started getting more, more and more excited about this whole story. Because if you have, let's say, only one family being described, you know, the fossil from only one family being described, that's one thing. But then when you start getting a collection of different families that are all present in uh, coral reefs today, that becomes a little bit more, um, uh, a, a better evidence, I would say, uh, for, for the actual origin of this specific fauna that is associated with reefs. I'm curious, what do we know about, you know, what happened or what can we maybe guess or, or imagine about what happened in that period of time, you know, between the, you know, um, between the boundary and the appearance of, you know, with these fish being fossilized? Was this a period of sort of, you know, rapid change in evolution? Do we, do we have a way of knowing? Well, <laughs> it's, it's, it's really hard to know what happened specifically with the reef fishes, but we do have some fossil evidence to suggest Obviously, many things went extinct. Many things that were present during the Cretaceous uh, went uh, were wiped out during this event, this boundary. And but but it appears that uh, this might have triggered, for example, the some some sort of um, ecological release uh, mechanism that we might call it this way that might have uh, been the trigger for the origin of these uh, new fish groups after the, the KPG. So exactly what happened, we don't know, but we know that many things went extinct, many things that were present beforehand. And after these things, these fish lineages, primitive fish lineages went extinct, these new ones start appearing. That's all we know. Oh, that's right. that's so cool. Um, I'm wondering now if we can chat just a little bit about the molecular techniques that are used to, you know, find out anything mm -hmm. about uh, fish evolution. This the challenge here is going to be not going way way over my head. Um, <laughs> but what are the what are these techniques like? You know, how do you learn anything meaningfully about the evolution of an animal? You know, millions and millions of years ago. What do you, what kind of evidence are you looking for? How does how does that whole process work? I'm I'm, I'm just incredibly curious and afraid that I won't be able to understand. Well, I'll try to, to simplify it as much as I can. <clears throat> and uh, essentially, uh, there has been very recent new techniques developed to <clears throat> put these fossils into the context of the present day fauna. Because essentially, these molecular techniques, obviously, they only function, they only work because you have DNA from present day fish. And unfortunately, it, you can't extract DNA from fossils. Fossils are essentially just rocks, unless they are very recent fossils. And in some cases, people have been able to extract uh, DNA from uh, some more recent stuff. But this goes back to, say, three, five thousand years ago. But I, I, it would be harder to get DNA from a creature that was living 63 million years ago. But what you have is their anatomy, right? So that anatomy is preserved in the in the rock. And you can compare, that's why you can assign these fossils to specific families because they have uh, these uh, synapomorphies, as we call it in um, taxonomy, that can tell you, oh, this, this fossil really belongs, has these unique features that tells you that it belongs to this specific group, right? And once you know that it belongs to this specific group, you can combine that those anatomical features that makes them belong to that group with the molecular data, with the DNA sequences that are used to, um, to uh, understand the relationship between the modern fish fauna and then use those fossils. Originally, you uh, you use those fossils to calibrate the molecular phylogeny, as we call it. So essentially, 
you you say oh we know that at this point in time there were fossils from this family present so you can call it uh let's say the around this uh period of time it must have appeared somewhere around this but the most recent uh techniques they allow you to put these fossils so this is called a fossilized birth death um model which was what we used in our paper it they allow you to put the fossils within the same evolutionary history as if they were going through the same diversification process as you estimate using the DNA sequences from the extant fauna. And then you uh, estimate the timing of things. So you estimate the tempo or divergence between lineages, putting these fossils also as part of the same evolutionary history. So not just as a calibration point, but as part of the whole uh, sequence of events that happened uh, in this specific um, fish group, if that makes sense, right? So that was the the, the kind of um, um, framework that we used to time the origin of these fish groups in our paper. Okay, and what sort of evolution um, you know has been seen in these fish groups, um, you know, since that you know original event? What, what you know, how, how have they changed over the over the uh, millions of years that have passed? <laughs> yeah, it, it, great. Great question, because yeah, a lot a lot has happened in the last 60 million years, which was essentially what shaped the the diversity that we have today in, in coral reefs. So we uh we have this very the, the fossil record tells this very interesting um biogeographical history for marine organisms in general, but mostly like reef associated ones that First, you have this um, this fossil uh, deposits in Italy, so where the Mediterranean lies today. And that was f around 50 million years ago. That was the center of marine biodiversity, right? Which is super interesting to think about. Like 50 million years ago, Italy was probably just this, you know, tropical archipelago surrounded by a very rich marine life. And through time, this center of uh, marine biodiversity or the place with the highest um, number of species of marine organisms has shifted in kind of an eastern migration so this phenomenon is what we call the hopping hotspots of marine life and they shifted from the mediterranean then towards the uh, arabian peninsula when you know the african um, plate tectonic plate was moving up to connect with uh, Asia. So right before that, the hotspot moved um, in that direction until it was found today where it is. So the center of marine biodiversity today is located in what we call the Indo-Australian archipelago that uh, encompasses like Philippines, Indonesia, and all these places that, that is the place with the highest geomorphological complexity today for um, marine life. And that's where I find most of the, the marine species, especially uh, coral reef associated ones. So there, there has been this, you know, biogeographical history and through time, things also diversified. These families that we're talking about, they um, diversified a lot in the Miocene, which is a period uh, between 23 to 5 million years ago, that aligns essentially with the formation of this Indo-Australian archipelago. So the formation of all these islands around Indonesia, Philippines, and, and the, when, when that thing started to get really geomorphologically complex, that's when these fish lineages became a lot more diversified. So that's well, um, well known through the, the fossil record. But now, <laughs> given these new fossil discoveries, we add another piece of a puzzle in this kind of hopping hotspots uh, idea that is probably before Italy, before everything was found in Italy in this center of marine biodiversity, 
of the Eocene around 50 million years ago, there was another potential hotspot in the Atlantic, which is super interesting. So there was a point, uh, another hopping hotspot point right after the KPG and before it moved to the Mediterranean hotspot. What we don't know is whether this Atlantic hotspot that was in the Paleocene, uh, so around 63 million years ago, whether it was also a hotspot of marine diversity or was it just a place that was receiving lineages from this hotspot that was already formed in the Mediterranean, right? So this is something that we still need to find out. We need more fossil evidence to know uh, if the actual origin of things is in the Atlantic, which we can speculate a little bit about, but we only new fossil discoveries can shed light in into this fascinating story, right? Oh, that's that's so cool. So I'm I'm wondering what causes a hot spot to move. Is it, um, you know, the the changing, you know, um, circumstances under the water? Is it a climatological thing? Is it, is, you know, is it water temperature? What causes, you know, your kind of biodiversity hotspots to form and, and move around, um, or do we know? Well, it's it's very linked to geology, which is something interesting. So I've been talking about, you know, geomorphological uh, complexity, and we, we know that a lot of shallow water, because coral reefs, they are mostly found in shallow waters. That there are coral reefs in deep waters as well, but the very diverse coral reefs, as we know them, are mostly a shallow water phenomenon, right? And the more um, shallow water habitat you have, so the more availability, the more area you have available for the colonization of these organisms that form coral reefs, the more diversity you will get. So that's why it's so linked with geomorphological complexity. So what happened was it was essentially a move in the island structures through time throughout the last 60 million years that defined these, uh, this, let's say, um, hopping of diversity through time. So it's essentially geology. As continents were moving, reshaping themselves, new island structures were forming and new geomorphologically complex areas were forming. And the fauna was just following that you know, um, geological structure, essentially. Is there anything, what about the structure? Um, is it the fact that the coral is there because it's the shallow water that's, you know, warmer and, and more, you know, um, suitable for them? Or, is, or are there other factors that, that kind of drive that? Yeah, it, it's linked to water temperature as well because coral reefs are limited mostly to the tropical areas. But within the, the tropical belt, um, the more, yeah, essentially... It, it's it's almost an area thing. It's like the, within these tropical areas, where do you have more area for the colonization of um, these organisms? So let's talk about corals now that um, form these uh, reefs. So the, these places, as these islands form, they have more area around them. And more complexity also generates some oceanographic conditions. So this industrial archipelago has also pretty complex current systems that carry larvae from one side to the other and from, you know, and, and the, essentially they spread this these larvae to both sides of this, the system. So it's a very open system and very well connected that has a lot of area that it, and this is what drives it essentially that's cool thank you and I'm, I'm wondering now um you know what's next for this work um you know be it something that you're working on or um you know be it the areas for future research that we should be on the lookout for <laughs> well i think fossil discoveries are always fascinating and we never really know where are they gonna appear and you know how and what are they going to tell us? 
So I think the next step is just to keep in, in this research specifically is just to keep uh, digging deeper, pun intended, into the 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 fossils and what they can tell us about all this um, interesting history that marine organisms went through. So I'm hoping that, for example, some more species will be described from these uh, deposits in Mexico that will maybe shed some light into, was it a hotspot of marine fauna or was it just a place uh, of, um, you know, dispersal from other areas? And yeah, this is, this is what I think uh, will be the, the next steps from here. Well, we'll, we'll certainly be looking forward to it. Um, thank you very much for joining me tonight. Oh, thank you. It was my pleasure. And that concludes this episode of Bioscience Talks. Just a reminder, the journal Bioscience is published by Oxford University Press on behalf of the American Institute of Biological Sciences and is made possible by the support of our members and donors. Thank you and talk to you next time.